Hey there, Blockhead Traders. Here at Blockhead Traders, I must inform you that we are not financial professionals. Nothing we say should be considered financial advice. We offer our own thoughts and opinions to you, the viewer. We expect you to take these opinions, form your own financial conclusions, and make your own financial decisions. Today is Wednesday, December 13th, 2023, and this is Blockhead Traders Weekly. In this week's episode, I'm joined by fellow blockhead trader Viper XL 007, and we got two topics up this week. We're first going to take a look at a premium selling play that I put on on natural gas because windmills just can't grill the burgers, as well as a just sentiment opinions on is the bull back. Uh, today we had a Fed announcement um, and the markets went crazy and rally, rally, rally. So is this a bear market rally or are the bulls really back in town? We'll touch on that in this week's episode. But first, I want to give a shout out to our Discord. A link in the description below. You can hop in there, say hello to myself, Viper, some of the other blockhead traders. Love to hear what you're trading. Love to hear what type of content you want to hear about. You can also find a link to thetagang.com forward slash sprocket888, where I post each and every one of my equity trades, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Also, you can pick this up wherever you get your podcasts in an audio-only format. If you can't find it there, let us know and we will get it there. But let's hop to this week's content. Viper, uh, first up, I want to touch on, before we get to the big market news of the Fed uh, announcement today that that caused just a massive rally. I want to touch on what the heck do you do when there's not a lot of earnings trades? Um, and when I say you, I'm really referring to me because I was out there looking for trades and uh, earnings season's kind of winding down. The holiday season is pretty much here in full swing. So there's really not a, comp a lot of company news. So I go back to say, okay, what do I trade? And I'm a big premium seller and I typically kind of look for staples and, you know, I'll do a regular kind of premium selling screen across equities and things like that. But largely equities have kind of been rallying. And when you get kind of much of a rally, a lot of your volatility kind of goes down and it gets a little bit tougher to sell premium at the, the rates that I like to sell it at because I like to be at least above a 50% IV percentile because I do want to be on the upper end of where that is. Uh, when I'm doing kind of a regular trade, I don't I don't need to go as high as the overextension that I look for in earnings trade, but I do want to be on the upper half somewhere. And so when the, the world of equities doesn't really pan out for me, I, I'd like to dabble in futures. And futures are cool because they have a lot of leverage, a lot of buying power. Um, the margin that's calculated is, is more favorable to me. Uh, the drawback to futures are when you do options on futures, not a lot of the futures products have options that are, um, let's say, easier to hold. Uh, there, there tend to be very large size products. They do have micro futures, uh, but a lot of times the micro futures don't actually have option chains associated with them. And so I have maybe about half a dozen futures trades that I like to take or, or I kind of follow. And if you go back in the episodes, you'll see what some of them are. Anyway, I decided to look through there and natural gas kind of jumped out as one of those ones that were fitting the bill. So when I when I look at futures, like I said, um, they're kind of bigger products, and I like to make sure that it's it's more of a probability is is closer to my favor. And so when I looked at natural gas, I wouldn't say that it was extra extended. Um, it was around a seventy two percent spot volatility, uh, something like that, and. The IV percentile was around 55, so kind of just in the middle of a volatility range, um, but a, a decent spot volatility in the 70s. And I decided to kind of look at the chain, you know, wh where's the premium fit in? And, and largely, if I'm not playing a binary event, I'm probably looking on the range of, you know, 35 to 45 days to expiration. So I started looking down the chain at the 44 days to expiration and the premium wasn't that bad uh, for kind of the, the deltas. And so I wanted to look at the chart. So let me pull up the chart because 
Uh, like I said, when futures are pretty beefy products, and, and some of them, particularly natural gas, I don't, don't remember the exact notional value of natural gas, but it's quite large. So, you know, trading the outright futures, um, you know, never never goes that well uh, for me because you get tiny little moves and it's, it's worth quite a bit. Um, but one thing really jumped out at the chart, and I know that I don't really trade indicators a lot of times, and but an indicator to me is just kind of a general, hey, this is what might be going on. And one of the indicators that I typically always have down here is an RSI. Uh, and what I want you to notice down here on this RSI that's on the screen is right here at the end, we are getting below that uh, 20 30%, sorry, I think I have it set at 30% uh, RSI value. That's that yellow bar there down below. And we had already dropped below, like could bit below that lower RSI. Now, this never really means that this, the thing is bottoming. I mean, it still can go a little bit lower and it can hang out down here below this for quite an extended period of time. In fact, if you go back um, on this chart, you'll even see where it, you know, it's dipping right around that 30 uh, and then it dropped below and it's kind of stayed down here. But you'll notice that the price still declined. So this isn't a, oh my gosh, we're below the RSA. So absolutely go, go, go by, right? We're going straight up. Um, that's not what I'm implying here. But to me, that starts giving a probability that we might be getting closer to a bottom or starting to go sideways down here. And that's really where premium selling does well. So if you're selling the, the put side, you're basically saying, hey, this is not going to go lower than blah, well, you know, whatever your strike is. And you make money if it goes up, if it goes up a little bit, if it goes sideways, no, really, if it goes down a little bit, you can still make money as long as it doesn't go massively down. And so in when I'm doing just a put side, um, you know, I might have considered a strangle or something like this. Uh, if the chart was a little bit more indicative that that maybe it was going to be in the middle of a range, if we were kind of already up on an upswing, uh, but I don't like to sell a call when I feel that we're on the bottom of a range because if you start deflecting off of that, you'll challenge that call pretty fast, uh, and 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 that's just a tough tough situation to be in. So. When I looked at this chart, I said, look, okay, we, we, if we're anywhere, we're likely at the bottom of a range. And so the only play I was looking at here is, is a put play, a naked put. Uh, and when I took a naked put on this, you know, that's where I'm okay to kind of go up to uh, up to a 35 delta. If I'm doing a strangle, I'll t typically stay down in a 15 to 25 delta. And then depending on the product and depending on the chart, um, I probably play most puts at around a 30 delta, 25 to 30 delta. Uh, but I get kind of aggressive if I think we are really at a bottom part. Um, and basically this little RSI indicator kind of gave me a little bit more confidence to, to take that. So I went ahead and I opened up uh, a naked put on there. I picked a $2.10 strike. Uh, that was about a 35 delta. So like I said, kind of a little bit more aggressive. I'm on that 44 days to expiration. The other key part was my portfolio right now doesn't have a lot of theta. And so I wanted to try to pick up a good bit of theta decay. And that particular strike this morning uh, was around a $52 uh, daily theta on there. That was able to collect $15 on that future. Um, and I say 15 just to keep it in standard multiples. Uh, I think actually the way natural gas points out, it was like 0 0.015, uh, but it's actually a factor of 100 when you go to figure out what the dollar amount is. So I collected about $1,500 in premium from this. Um, like I said, it's a very big contract with a lot of notional value. So it took $9,500 in buying power. And I see, I realize my math is a little bit wrong here uh, because it was actually $8,000 in buying power net. Uh, when you take into the fifteen hundred dollars that I had correct co collected, uh, so not not net eighty five hundred actually was net eight thousand, and this is just something that I'll kind of hang on to. Um, I can pull up the the P and L chart of that. Where does it stand today? Uh, like I said, it, it could just be one of those uh, first first month got lucky, first move, first play. You know, a lot of times your option trades when I take them go red the first day. Uh, this particular one, natural gas rally today. Um, so you can see where we sit right now. Uh, as far as the break even, the break even is down here a little bit below $2. 
uh, to 10 is my strike. These yellow lines out here are 10% move. Uh, this is where we stand today. Uh, and the gray box is currently set to a one standard deviation move uh, in in uh, natural gas. So it was a little bit aggressive. So you can see a one standard deviation move to the downside uh, does put me kind of in the hole. Uh, but so far, so good on this trade. And, and this is more of my run-of-the-mill premium selling. So Viper, the next topic is the bulls are back, question mark. Um, today was, I didn't read the whole Fed announcement, um, but the Federal Reserve kind of met for the last time here in 2024 uh, for their, their rate meetings. Uh, they did hold rates steady. They did not hike rates. Uh, but the big news was they were indicating that there would be rate cuts in 24. And the whole market, I, I think, has been waiting for, oh, when, when are the Fed going to back off? You know, and they, they've kind of been in a pause state. And that kind of caused people to rally saying, oh, the Fed might be pivoting. The Fed might be pivoting. And everyone's like, oh, when are they going to cut? When are they going to cut? And then, you know, you got some people saying, oh, they're not going to cut till 25. And where's the dot plot? And my understanding from the comments from Chairman Powell uh, as the, the conclusion of the Fed meetings was that there was a pretty strong consensus that there were probably three rate cuts coming in 24. I don't actually know if that was the words that came out of his mouth or if that was uh, somebody's interpretation. I probably should have read the transcript before we uh, decided to record this evening. All I know is full ahead go. Uh, rocket ships started taking off everywhere. Uh, the Russell, I think, rocketed almost 70 points today. I believe the Dow uh, hit a new all-time high of over 37,000. I believe the the S&P also just rocketed today. I'm not sure how much it went up. Um, and the NASDAQ, too, was also just like like rocket fuel all the way around. Um, I know in, in my portfolio, I have what I call the wall of shame, uh, which are various uh, holdings that I have been assigned over the times of, of selling premium. And a lot of times I'm, I'm lucky enough to battle back on that premium and, and kind of, you know, get the shares assigned and called away from me for a profit. But I got a couple of duds that have been hanging out in there. And let me tell you, those things started uh, getting some wings today. Yeah, so... I mean, just just kind of rocket fuel all around, like like you mentioned. That's a big jump on the the S and P there, and I mean the the Russell to me was. I always pay attention to the Russell. Maybe it's because I have a, a open strangle on it, but the Russell tends to have a lot more volatility than the S and P. So I tend to follow the Russell a lot more. And and the Russell move today, I think, was over four percent, which was is just ginormous. And so that really kind of begs the question: that is this a bull market? And if it is. What are you going to do differently, Sprocket? Uh, we've we've kind of been in a lot of bear market. Uh, I actually started uh, my trading career or, or recent trading career uh, prior to the pandemic. Uh, it was kind of bull bull market. Then uh, the pandemic came, everything shut down, and we, everybody was pretty sure we were going to the floor. Uh, and then the massive recovery off of there. There was, you know, a lot of uh, euphoria and what have you as that went on. And then we kind of been on a big bear slide for a while with a couple of rally pops uh, in, in recent history here. Uh, so what have I learned over the years? What, what will I likely do in this case if we really are entering into a bull market? And truthfully, probably not a whole lot different. Um, I've gone through a few different uh, experiments over the years as far as trying to to deviate away from what I've spent most of my time working on, and that's premium selling. And that hasn't fared as well for me when I have strayed from that premium selling um, mechanics that I, I put together. So uh, premium selling is nice because you tend to do well no matter what direction. Uh, when you kind of set it up there, that's the, the statistical probability that you're playing. However, 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 uh, it does get a little bit more few and far between on the trades that you take because the more that you have rallies, um, you know, the volatility isn't quite as great. And so your premium isn't quite as great. The percentages tend to come in. And so it's not as easy in a bull market rally to pick up a lot of premium. It still definitely can be done, uh, but you have to be a little bit more selective. 
I would say the one thing that I will take advantage of in a bull market that I've been kind of working on perfecting is kind of swing trading where uh, I won't really probably go as much into the premium selling uh, because the premium just won't be as thick, but uh, I might fire off more kind of swing trades within the session hours or something that's kind of quick uh, pre-market with the futures and stuff like that, uh, where I'm trying to sell a couple contracts, uh, then buy them back or short them over short times as, as we're kind of taking the, the stair stepping, uh, looking at price action. I will probably dabble that a little bit more because one thing, uh, and, and some new traders can might attest to this, they do really well in a bull market. And maybe that's because they tend to go long on shares. And if everything is rising tide, then you kind of just throw something at the wall and chances are you'll probably get it right. And so I feel like my probability for doing better at kind of swing trading is likely to be more uh, in my favor uh, when the the whole waters are rising uh, versus uh, spotty. So Viper, what do you do? Uh, do you think this is a bull market? Do you think it's a bear market? Do you like meh? And and if so, what 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 changes for you? Yeah, um, I mean, I agree mostly with what you said. Um, I I'm taking a little more, um, at least one metric that I'm looking at as far as bull, bear, up, down, left, right, all that kind of stuff. Um, and this is a highly, highly subjective uh, metric, but um, I. It, it's worth it to me, um, but we'll see if it actually plan, pans out or not. So to to show it real quick, let's hop over um, to my chart here, and I want to highlight a couple of things. So obviously this is the market recently. Like we just said, SPX is knocking on new all-time highs. Um, Dow Jones already got it. Um, so we expect tomorrow, probably tomorrow or by the end of this week, uh, probably by the time this airs, SPX will be at all-time highs. So with several major indicators at all-time highs, uh, you know, certainly that's got to mean the bull's back, right? Um, <clears throat> but what I think is interesting is, like, if we compare some history here and, and zoom back to what we're looking for is major corrections, and let's just do some mental gymnastics on on that point in time. So obviously here we had a 2020 pandemic crash, so what ha where were we mentally um, when we recovered from the pandemic crash? Well, year-wise, that was um, August 2020. Um, so thinking back, August 2020, yeah, the, like mentally we were still raring and tearing full steam ahead. Um, we just recovered this massive crash in the market. Um, so, you know, the party was still going, if you will. Um, <clears throat> so that's not very comparable to where we are today. Uh, if we go back to the, the, the last big crash before that, it was two, oh, that's 18. Let's keep going back a little bit further. It was actually on the weekly. I think this looks a little bit better. Um, so on the weekly, when we go back to the last big crash before that, it's back here which everybody knows as the 08 housing market crash. And this is where things get interesting to me in this thought experiment, which is, uh, granted, I obviously was not in the market uh, actively back then. I was, you know, had just gotten my first full-time job and, you know, had this retirement account, but I didn't know what the heck to do with it. So I just kind of ignored it. And I mostly listened to, um, my my elders around me and how they responded to the housing market crash and the way they would say like I am not checking my 401k I'm not you know and and the things they were saying then um, were very similar to the things I've said the past year and a half um, you know the the feelings I've had of just like red 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 all that kind of stuff so now emotionally psychologically this is feeling a little more relevant to where we are today so again. If we fast forward to when we recovered from that dip, uh, dip, <laughs> a bit of a bit of a bit of a dip, but 
uh, when we recovered from that, we were in uh, early 2013 when we officially recuperated um, from that. So to me, that feels more like where we are now. Um, again, highly subjective, but big crash 2020, recovery 2020. The news, I mean, before the pandemic crash, there was already news about this is, you know, this his, I don't know if it was historic at that point, but it was very close to historic bull rally, bull market just has spanned decades, um, <clears throat> a decade or more um, was the narrative. And certainly when we came out of the pandemic crash, it was like, we're not done yet. We're going. So that was a very different emotional feel to me. 2013 feels more like where we are today. And so if we look at the chart, you know, I mean, that was, I wouldn't say that that was necessarily the start of the bull market. This is, you know, you could say it started way back here in 09, but nobody would believe you because the sentiment was so bad. And so that's, again, where that subjectivity really comes in. But that is to say that, you know, if I were uh, throwing darts at the wall, it feels to me like the bull is back just because of how this compares to that 2013 feel of just relief of we just woof we made it um you know that was rough and we're back where we started now and like that feels a little bit more like the journey we've been on since late 20 uh, since early 22 um to now we're like you know it's like oh man we're about to crack all-time highs but it doesn't feel very good it doesn't feel like the party's here but it just feels like whew, we made it um so in my very non scientific uh metric um that feels like to me that I want to call it the bull's back baby <laughs> on the other hand my friend you could be my view and say, go back in time, back to that 08 crisis, and uh, then roll back a little bit more, and you get the dot-com boom, where everything is hunky-dory, cruising to the moon, and we had a dot-com crash. And then just before Lehman collapsed, we were like, yes, we finally got back. We got the dot-com behind us. We are good to go, baby. The bull is back. And then what happened? Mm, where are we? It's true. That is, uh, <laughs> you know, then, and, and those are, I mean, I guess that's important to unpack because both of those, um, both of those are, are fairly, uh, unpredictable black swan events. I mean, you know, there's obviously indicators of the housing market bubble and all that kind of stuff. Um, but, it is an important point to call out as far as lessons we've learned that uh, you, the main point is certainly never to get comfortable in which direction you think it's going. Yeah, you say black swan events, but I just want to play, you know, the devil's advocate side here, you know, the, the yin and the yang of this. And, you know, if you go back and you read history books and different financial articles, there was people before the housing market crisis saying, guys, your credit's too loose. You're extending too much credit. You're extending too much credit. There was a bunch of doomsdayers out there. Not a bunch. There was a couple of them out there saying, this is coming. This is coming. You know, and if I fast forward to today, there's a, ooh, economies, this is too hot. This is not sustainable. This is, you know, people saying, you know, recession coming, recession coming. Uh, so I think it just goes to show you how unpredictable some of this stuff is. I don't want to try to dissuade you in the bear camp or the bull camp uh, because my personal opinion and, and experience here is, you know what? If you only make money in a bull market or a bear market, you're going to miss out on a chunk of fun. So whatever strategy you got, uh, whether it's one strategy or a different strategy, you got to have a strategy for everything, right? You got to be able to pull out the playbook for whatever the weather is coming at you. So regardless of all that, Viper, um, you, you're, you're in the bull camp potentially. So what about your strategy are you going to look at? What are you going to do differently? Yeah. If anything. And I mean, and, and you're absolutely right. Like there's always those 
warning signs and those those flickering lights um you know the was that a power flicker or you know like that sort of thing it, we've all watched the movies um the like when i when i refer to those as black swan events like the black swan is the the unpredictable of when will it happen like i mean yeah there's a, there's all these warning signs of like she's going to blow she's going to blow but you you never know when the pressure cooker is going to go and if something is going to come in and, and, and save it or whatever. So the black swan is the fact that nobody could say from this high on the chart um, we're down only, you know, or that sort of thing. It was just kind of rug out of nowhere, like, whoop, gotcha. Um, so mostly that's that's the kind of the – when I refer to it as black swan, it's that of like you everything looked this way. Sure, people are saying whatever they're saying, but then out of nowhere, um, so <clears throat> with that in mind, um, I I agree with uh, with your point that you made on what the strategy is um, as far as kind of knowing the direction, um, leaning into that slightly, um, but also being prepared for any reversal in the direction, and that obviously goes way deeper into everything I've been doing um, to try to better my charting skills. Because one thing I had found um, on the charts is there was, there was an initial, let's say price level um, that I used to chart. And then only, I mean, after two years of doing this and only within the last three months, all of a sudden it finally clicked of like, hold on, there's an actual, tiny little behavior that actually signals a potential reversal. Um, and then running back through charts and like throwing down the old level that I had of like, it, and, it, and when I say old level, we're not going to get into it, but just, I mean, it's the same level anybody would draw when you're looking at a chart, you see a peak, you see a drop, you throw a level on the peak, you throw a level on the drop and you're like, Oh, we got to clear that peak again. Like that sort of stuff of, of high level generalities. Um, and I went back and ran and I was like, holy cow, like there was so much missed opportunity to not catch the potential reversal. Um, and now that I've done several trades doing that, um, and, oh man, it's like driving a Ferrari or something just because um, you can have a super tight stop loss. You should because it's never guaranteed that it's going to reverse. It's a potential reversal. But because you're so early in the move, you can have a super tight stop loss on it. Um, which is fantastic. And then if you catch it, then literally by the time you're to the point that I, the old level, the easy, obvious level, uh, by the time the price is there, you're already thinking about taking a profit target. Um, <clears throat> so I bring that up to say trading in the direction of the market, um, potential, well, the direction of the trend, um, because even in a bull market, there's going to be uptrends, downtrends, um, and there will be macro trends as well. Um, so knowing the chart, knowing what direction it's in and then using that information accordingly. So like you said, um, if it's in an uptrend, t trying to take more longs than shorts, but one thing I'm absolutely going to do as far as changing my behavior is I'm going to still not be afraid to take shorts, even in an uptrend. But now knowing everything I just said, when you're swimming against those waters, it kind of changes your play structure. Uh, you still need to have good risk to reward ratio of making the trade worth it. But there's a whole mentality shift, uh, which I didn't have before. You know, before it was like, this feels good enough. We should retreat now. And so I'm going to take a short and I'm going to go heavy on it and we're just going to let it ride. Um, that's stupid. That's giving up your money. That's just going to lead to losses. Um, so, but exactly like you said, like if you're just taking longs in an uptrend market in a bull market, you're going to win because that's just the way the river's flowing. So I don't want to fall into that mental trap of like, I am killing it because I've been there, done that. That was <laughs> around when we started this show was like, man, we should do a show. This is awesome. We just keep trading and making money. Um, <clears throat> so I want to constantly still take those shorts as the proof of growth metric of even in an uptrend, you still should be able to take shorts, um, mitigate losses, good stop losses, all that kind of stuff, and still get some winners um, on the shorts, uh, but also keeping them tight and knowing that you're going against the grain, 
don't do that too hard. Don't do that too often, whatever. Um, so I definitely want to do more of that. Uh, the other thing I want to do is like we can see on the chart here, we're coming up on all time high. And so, I mean, exactly like you pointed out back here, uh, dot com bubble to the housing bubble. I mean, that was um, what some would call a double top right there. Like we came right back to this 1550 on the uh, S&P and then down we went. So um, and all all TA rules would say um, we do need to make higher highs here and come back and test and confirm support and all that good stuff. So at this point, even if we're in a bowl, going into all-time highs, uh, I'm not changing anything per se, and I'm certainly keeping uh, the chart flipped upside down um, to kind of shake that bias of, you know, don't look at the chart and say all-time highs, up we go. Flip the chart over and make sure that you still see the same thing you should be seeing. So at this point in time, I'm going to, you know, whatever plays I have or, or whatever, like keep doing everything normal. Um, see where we go around this all time high. Maybe we reverse and start running back down. That's cool. We've obviously been there before and we can make money in that direction. If we do come back down, then, um, I'm going to keep, so I've obviously talked before about this whole, um, ETF, uh, index ETF accumulation strategy that I had. And, um, you know, I'm going to keep doing that for now, as far as we'll call that my idle play, because that's like, I don't want to think about this money. Um, but I want it to be doing something for me. And so as you may have recalled, um, kind of all through this, I don't remember exactly what my cost basis was. Um, but all through this chop down here, I had the DCA daily buys of, um, the VO, the VTI, the Vanguard index ETFs. Um, and then as you also may recall, I think I surprised Sprocket on the show when right around this peak here, um, I dumped it. <laughs> I said, you know what? I, I am, <laughs> I'm out. I'm closing these things down. And he was like, wait, that means that down we go. I mean, uh, oddly enough, down we went. Um, but I mean, I closed it. I mean, I didn't stop the buys. You know, I just let it keep running, let it keep buying every day. And that just ended up working out really nicely to kind of DCA this little dip here. So that buy is still happening right now. Um, I'm considering pulling some of it back just like I did here. So there's your warning. <laughs> oh, double top. Here it comes. Oh, double man. Top. Um, and that's also just thinking out loud the strategy of like, hey, you're at a critical level. We were at a critical level and almost um, at a critical level before. And so take some of that off the table. And the way that strategy worked, because it was a slow burn accumulation, like you, you just got to let it accumulate and it has and it's now up decently um so pull some of that off let it keep running let it cycle back in um <clears throat> i suppose the alternative take would be obviously of, at some point we're going to make new all-time highs and we're going to start running again so do i want to constantly be clearing that check of you know an average cost basis down here um across this entire lull and that's a valid point as far as like what's my time horizon on this because having a whole bunch of a heavy anchor down here at this price when we start going way up um you know that's something to think about too and something i have been thinking about so not sure that i'll actually pull anything off here uh just because of the time the timeline here between these and knowing that whether it's now whether it's down and back up, um, I don't want to be DCAing at higher and higher all-time highs. That's when you want to start pulling some of that money back. But I bring it up because I like the play. It's just, it, like I said, it's very idle, it's very mindless, and it's playing into the strengths of the index, which obviously the strength of any index is uh, on a long enough time horizon, it's up and to the right period. Um, that's just, I mean, you can find all sorts of actual data behind just how up and to the right it is, but it's up and to the right. So I want to have that in my portfolio. 
Um, so we'll see. But that's uh, kind of the two ways I'm going after it as far as trading, being aware of trend, being careful to trade around that trend, but not afraid to trade against the trend and just using that in the direction. But then also having this idle accumulation strategy um, for the very long 10, 15, 20 year time horizon um, plays. That brings us to the end of this week's episode. As you can see, you know, we, we could be on the cusp with a big binary event today of are we starting a new bull market? Uh, are we going to, you know, keep, keep the tracement back into the bear, bear fund? We're really at a, a critical juncture point or at least rapidly approaching it soon. And, you know, to each his own strategy as far as what emerges and what works for you in what particular market environment. I myself will probably be kind of idling a little bit as we head into the balance of the year. The volumes get pretty thin out there in the market around Christmas and New Year's, and they don't really start picking back up till uh, early January there. We still got a, probably a couple of good trading days left as far as volume before it really starts kind of drying up. And, you know, there's opportunities out there. Hopefully you've been perfecting your different strategies, preparing different playbooks uh, for the different environments that might roll out. Uh, hope you guys are having a lot of fun out there, finding the strategy that works for you. And good luck. And remember, think outside the block. <laughs>